on, Jimmy. <laughs> You're going to fight against when this balloon of yours goes up. Forces of anarchy. Wreckers of law and order. Let's see? Communists, Maoists. Trotskyists, neo-Trotskyists, crypto-Trotskyists, union leaders, communist union leaders. See? Atheists, agnostics, long-haired weirdos, short-haired weirdos, vandals, hooligans. The government hug the government love. The government hug the government love. The government hug the government love. Uh, Stephen, so thanks for being with us today. Uh, and you're here to talk about your forthcoming book uh, on uh, the relationship between philosophy and football, which is due out in March, right? I think so. Yes. Yeah, I saw. I saw the. Uh, I saw you advertised on Twitter, so I said I'm on that. Um, now, firstly, maybe I was wondering, could you talk to us a little bit about your research in general in philosophy? What are your interests? Well, I, I'm mainly a metaphysician, uh, and I work primarily on causation. Um, and I'd, for a number of years, been developing a theory of causal powers. Um, but I think when you've worked on one area for 15 years or so, you, you start looking further afield and uh, trying to branch out a bit. And um, some time ago, I, I discovered the philosophy of sport as a field, and it's um, got I researched into that further. And uh, so I did a book called Watching Sport in 2011, I think. Um, but of course, um, another big interest I have is in football. And once you discover there is such a thing as philosophy of sport, then, um, obviously I started thinking about the philosophical issues that were arising in football. Okay. And so, I mean, you start the book, um, and thanks for giving me, um, uh, a copy in advance to have a look at. Um, you start the book with a, a little biographical sketch, which is uh, um, you were talking about your first game of football uh, at uh, Bramall Lane, I think, is that right, with Sheffield United. So uh, I'm wondering, yeah. what is the, well, yeah, what is the, what is the, what's the motivation then for you, given that it's so rooted in your uh, your upbringing, your childhood, and uh, um, you've got this, I guess, sort of uh, a romantic uh, notion of football. At least from the opening pages of your book, I think, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I had this idea that um, I, th I think one's introduction to football is especially in person at a stadium. It's a very significant moment. Uh, but I also started thinking that I, I wanted this to be a book. Um, I wanted this to be the most accessible book I've written because I want uh, particularly football fans who've never done any philosophy sure. before to to be able to pick it up and get something out of it and so i was also conscious that as well as talking about one's introduction to football i was also giving a bit of an introduction to philosophy or philosophical approach to football so i i i, I decided i wanted to consider this topic of your introduction and i thought it'd be quite amusing to do it as the very first chapter of the book and call it introduction because it is about introduction. Okay, okay. So, so, um, <laughs> well, like, so the relationship between philosophy and football. Then, I mean, and you're a you're a long time fan um, of football and philosophy. I guess so. I got a sort of a very sort of basic Socratic question for you. Um, does football make you think? And in what way does it make you think? Well, I, I believe it does, uh, but I'm not saying it makes everyone think. I mean, so. Part of the, the success of football as this global phenomenon, the, the world's most popular spectator sport, I, I think it's because it is multifaceted and it's 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 possible to understand football at just about any level of depth. So that's great if you're just some kids playing in the street like I was. You know, we used to play on the road. We just literally put down the jumpers as goalposts and uh, and all you you know you can just understand it at a really superficial level that one side's trying to get the ball in the other's goal and vice versa but i think it's it's success it is so multi-led so uh different ways that, in which you can understand football to sort of any any level of depth so i i think it's that popular appeal is that it, it can uh, you know, it can fascinate 
somebody um, regardless of their background. So someone like me and you, who, uh, you know, we're philosophers as well, um, you know, it's, it's perfectly possible that while we're at a game and, you, you know, you, you're isolated from all your worldly concerns, that your mind can start wandering onto metaphysical issues. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I find myself when I'm at football games, uh, I think about all types of things like p- politics, football, tribalism, uh, all all of these all of these things, and I'll, I'll get your 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 opinions on them. Um, so, mm. um, I guess uh, in in your book, uh, you have it divided into uh, different sections or different philosophical themes, and mm. uh, I thought maybe we could go through each one of those individually and it'd give sort of the listeners. Uh, a sense sure. of what your book is about, um, and it's a, it's a really, it's a uh, you write really well. You write, you're a really clear writer. So when it comes out, I, I recommend you. everybody, um, everybody uh, buys it. Um, the um, the first thing you talk about, and I suppose it's the one that's that everybody's, it's the cliche that's attached to football, uh, according to Pele. Mm. You know that football is the beautiful game, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah. you, you talk about the aesthetic nature of football. Uh, the mm. the, uh, the about the nature of beauty. So I was wondering, could you maybe expand on that a little bit? Yeah, well, I I was trying to get behind the cliche, and um, you know, I, I think any book on philosophy and football is bound to mention it. So I I tried to get it out there early, but then tried to get further behind it, which we can do in various ways. But so I mean, so one thing is just um. You know, there, there are very many aesthetic categories that could apply to football and, and beauty, I think, isn't always the most natural one anyway. I, I see that as a rather kind of overarching aesthetic category. It just seems that there are some things, even works of art, that you wouldn't describe as beautiful as such. So, so think of a novel. If you read a novel, you might say it's gripping or you might say it's you know, a good story or it's compelling, but it's, it's, it would seem unusual to describe it as a beautiful novel. So I, I think something like that's going on in football where there's, there's, um, there's a bunch of aesthetic categories. And, and when we speak of, uh, something being beautiful, I, I think we're usually talking in a fairly casual way. So I, I was interested in getting behind, uh, first of all, the kind of superficial aesthetic categories that we see. So, for example, I, I think speed and power are some of the things we find appealing in football, which is one of the reasons I think why we like to, why we prefer to watch elite level football rather than l- low level amateur like Sunday league stuff isn't very pretty to watch <laughs> because there isn't as much speed and power and fitness and extension and all, all these aesthetic categories that come in. So, so I was, I was trying to get a bit behind that and, and think of the different ways in which football can be appreciated aesthetically. But then also it's a sort of overarching theme of the book is that I'm looking what the kind of preconditions are that for that aesthetic sure. in football. Uh, because I've, I think there's a, there's a kind of paradox. It's not strictly a paradox, but, um, to, towards the end of the book, we might come on to this later that I, I think that if, if you're just aiming to create beauty, then you're not really playing football. You know, it's, it's not, um, it shouldn't be your primary aim. People want to win. Football's about winning. Coaches are going to be judged. I think John on Giles results. said that, didn't he? Um, you win pretty, or you can win ugly. Yeah. Well, that's it. So I've I've not met a, a single football fan who who would prefer to lose beautifully <laughs> than, than than winning ugly. You know, and and every coach and every player. So I think um, I think the aesthetic of football is important, though. In in that you know it, it explains why it's the world's most popular spectator sport it it can be beautiful to watch even if even if there's sublime moments of of few and far between and uh after decades of watching sheffield united i can tell you those sublime moments are very few and far between 
but they can um you know it's it's like if you go to an art gallery uh you might not be interested in 99 percent of what you see but then you you're suddenly struck by that one uh, van gogh or whatever it is hanging and that that really stands out so i i think football is a bit like that so that that's that's what I think is a bit misleading about the the old cliche saying football is the beautiful game. It's also the ugly game, you know, and, and teams will play ugly to win when they need to. But but I was I was trying to get I I, I think the the aesthetics of football is also multi layered. So you 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 can have sort of very concrete uh, moments of, of beauty. So I'm thinking. Um, Seeing an overhead kick, see, seeing a chip, seeing a fine save from a goalkeeper when the body's fully extended and reaching, you know, leaping like a salmon and plucking the ball out of the air. There's, so there's that very concrete level of aesthetics that everyone can see and understand. But I, I also think it's very multi-layered. So the more you understand about football, you could appreciate, for instance, the beauty the beauty in, a ta- in tactics or a system that a team plays. So you, you could see a move as beautiful or, or even a, a formation or, say, the fluidity with which a team plays or, or almost like an organic unity. You know, the, the best football teams are going to function almost as if they are a single entity. With a with a shared consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I'm, so I'm not saying literally, but you know that that you can really appreciate that kind of high level of abstraction which is why people are uh, skeptical about ronaldo or why he's a divisive figure because he's he's quite a he's quite a, an individualistic oriented player yes yes which of course is the theme of another chapter but i don't know whether you want to go straight um, on to that not, one not, yet not quite um, maybe well i mean not uh, not that's yet okay. okay yeah i mean the, um, I'm yeah. wondering, just on a basic level, what philosophers of aesthetics are informing your 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 sort of treatment of uh, aesthetics and beauty in football? Uh, is are you using Hume? Are you using Kant? Well, Hume Hume comes into it a lot. Is Hume's essay on the standard of taste? Because that that's partly because of a kind of general issue I've got in um, what I'd call the dispositional theory of aesthetics that. So I'm quite interested in a kind of debate, a basic debate between objectivism and subjectivism in aesthetics. But I, I, I want something that's kind of in between and acknowledges what's what's strong and what's weak in those. And uh, Hume, who's of course his most famous book, is a treatise of human nature, and I, and I think he really is a philosopher of human nature, and can see that. Um, we have a kind of a shared taste, but it's it also allows some variation. So, you know, Van Gogh is very, very popular. He appeals to a lot of us, but not to everyone. So some people will have uh, different taste and unusual tastes, maybe. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in quite a dispositional framework in that I can see that there are certain things that just sort of... Uh, primitively appeal to us as part of our human nature while also allowing that that's nothing more than um, a tendency view so that there are certain things that tend to appeal to us aesthetically tend to give us that positive aesthetic response um, but I would also add to that that um, and this might be rather controversial but I'd, I also um, quite like an institutional theory of art. So from people like Dickey. So and could you just explain that briefly? Sure, sure absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and, I, and I can bring this back to sport as well. So, you know, there is a question of what is art. And uh, naturally, some people speak of, you know, can sport be art? Is sport the same thing as art, given that it's capable of producing sure. beauty? And, and on that, I would say, well, no, it's not that, um, first of all, you've got kind of aesthetic properties or things that tend to appeal to human beings aesthetically. Uh, and that's quite separate from the issue of what is art, because you can have a beautiful sunset 
you know, you, you can have aesthetic experiences from natural objects like a, a bunch of flowers or something. Um, so then what, what makes something art? Well, I see that as, um, art is a status bestowed upon certain forms of practice by a set of social institutions, namely the art institutions. So that's galleries, critics, uh, arts councils, um, and, and I'm, and I'm actually going to say the same about sport as well. So I think, Sport is a status bestowed upon certain forms of practice by the institutions of sport. Uh, and of course, the most powerful institution in sport is the International Olympic Committee. And the International Olympic Committee says that um, mountain biking is a sport, which I think is one that was added to the Olympics in the last 20 right. years or so. Uh but but chess is not a sport. Tiddlywinks is Super. not a sport. So yeah, so that there are certain things that just so far have always been considered to be games that haven't had have that st- status of sport bestowed upon them. So even if football is uh, capable of producing these positive aesthetic experiences from uh, for us, um, I don't think sport is art but but that's that's a kind of a a contingent feature of it anyway um uh, so it's a kind of an institutional theory would be anti-essentialist it's it's saying that there isn't some essential feature of art that makes it art or an essential feature of sport that makes it sport it's that um you know it's giving a kind of story in terms of social institutions as to what constitutes those things so that that's a kind of background f- aesthetic framework, but um, it, it certainly is in the background because, I, as as I said at the start, I did want this book to be accessible, and um, but I would still hope that trained philosophers who who read it can see between the lines what my sort of background commitments are on things like aesthetics and metaphysics. Okay, um, so. Yeah, would you be comfortable with calling it a craft? Or a beautiful craft, football? Oh, I um, Pe- People... I'm not sure know, about people that. People do say it, though, you know, <laughs> they practice his craft and things like that, or uh, this player is a master of his craft. Yeah, I was just wondering. Yeah, I could see craft applying to particular parts within football. You know, so you, you could say, uh, suppose you've got a creative midfielder. There's the one, that's the one who crafts out the chances. So he's a, a particular subset of skills. Um, so, so maybe. So maybe. the next thing, uh, you talk about, Stephen, is, uh, the concept of holes. W-H-O-L-E-S. Um, so that's, yes. uh, to do with the, um, I guess the question of, you know, the idea of a team, the idea of a formation, or how things come together. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I, th- I think one of the most obvious things you can say about football, so after you've got the cliche out of the way that it's the beautiful game, maybe the next most striking thing is that it is a team game. And I think it is... Um, well, may, maybe I've got, I don't know the sports as much as football, but it seems to me absolutely a team game to its core. And, uh, so I, I'm quite interested in the, the phenomena where you can get a really good team, even though it is not made of the best star players. Um, or you can have a team that's put together of, of the world superstars and they just can't play well together as a side. So there, there's been some notorious cases of this. There, there was the, uh, England side of 10 or 15 years ago that had all these star midfielders like Scholes and Gerrard and Lampard and Beckham and they couldn't really function as a, but on as paper a team, it looked good. I suppose. Because it looks good, yeah. I mean, I, I assume, and I'm not the biggest England fan, so, but I, but I would assume that the problem there was that the, the players were all too similar, and and 
a, a good team needs um, lots of different roles covered, and there's no point two players playing exactly the same role. Um, and then in contrast to England, you get teams such as, well, national team for Germany. And I know that I know they flopped at the uh, the World Cup that's just gone. But looking at them historically, they they've often been the best team at the World Cup, even though uh, they haven't always had the greatest superstar players. Uh, so if if you look at the German team that won the World Cup four years ago in in Brazil, you'd maybe think, well, then they're not the greatest individual players. You know, Chelsea's not going to buy many of them, even if. Chelsea's got all, all this money to spend, uh, but but you know maybe that should force us to to reconsider what we take a great player to be because I, I would have thought that if if a player can fit into a system that works as a whole and the team wins the competition, then you know that's isn't that the sort of player you want rather than maybe someone who is more of a, an individualist. You know, we, we've all known cases of players who seem absolutely brilliant as individuals, but then, you know, play in sides that underachieve. Yeah, I mean, is it is it is it the idea of the whole? Then, like, is it something which has allows space for individual creativity and flair and improvisation, yet within a, a general structure? Well, yeah. So, I, I mean, I I am quite interested in the me- metaphysics of holes and their parts anyway so so this seemed a bit of an open goal for me to, very good, to consider, very good. <laughs> yeah <laughs> to consider the team as the whole and and uh, so in the last couple of years i've i've sort of undergone a conversion to emergentism okay, could you explain that a little so bit I'm, yeah so I, so i'm interested in how it's possible that holes can have properties or causal powers that are not properties or causal powers of the parts, nor just of the aggregation of the sure. parts. So, for example, uh, life, as far as we know, emerges from lifeless parts. You know, so my body has lots of carbon molecules and various other constituents that are not living things, and yet I am a living thing. Similarly, uh, mind emerges from mindless parts uh, as far as i know my i've got this brain full of neurons but a neuron doesn't think but you put enough of them together and you've got something that does think so how is that possible um and um so a few years ago when i was working on this um i i got attracted to a theory that uh, we call the causal transformative theory, which basically means that emergence occurs. Uh, it's more than just the aggregation of the parts. It's where the parts causally interact and change each other. So I'll give you one simple example, and then I'll get back to football. Uh, but if you consider water, sure. uh, w- water has the uh, property of power, I would say, uh, that it can uh, put out fires, but neither of its constituents has has this power. In fact, it's got the opposite power. Both hydrogen and oxygen, if you put them on fire, would fuel it. So how is it that the whole has this very different property from the part? Well, the explanation, I would say, is that um, the parts aren't just... Uh, grouped together like um, two Lego bricks. It's that they enter into an interaction that, that means that they both change. And we understand this in the case of water because uh, when the chemical bonding occurs, hydrogen, the hydrogen and, and uh, oxygen atoms complete each other's outer shell of electrons. So there is a transformation that occurs from this interaction. Uh, of the parts now you know if you go to football teams this seems a really clear and maybe even the simplest case you can have of this because when uh, when you play together as a team of course you're causally interacting with your teammates all the time 
So if I play a pass to you, uh, you know, you're having to move and respond, uh, and... Check, respond, accept the pass. And so a good team that's functioning well, you're going to have the 11 players all interacting with each other, changing each other's behavior, responding to the pass, to the run. So Strategy as well, I guess, yeah. Absolutely. So I think this does give us a sense in which the whole really can be more or sometimes less than the sum of the parts. Um, now, I've got a particular interest in this topic at the moment because my team, Sheffield United, have uh, one of the lowest wage bills in the championship and we don't have any real star players. But at this moment in time, we are a really good team. Brilliant. Um yeah, the coach, Chris Wilder, who's, who used to play for Sheffield United, he's really got them playing uh, a system that they all know. Uh, so it's, it's almost like a telepathy develops between the players. And that, that is so mm, good to watch. Mm. And to, to, to because you're kind of knowing that you haven't bought the success just by spending lots of money on star players and paying the highest wage bill. You've kind of thought through football as a as a problem to be solved and in, and uh, so in the book i mention another famous case like this going back some time so not all readers will remember this but brian clough's success at nottingham forest um i i heard that he had this idea of, of treating the team as like a jigsaw puzzle and he kind of had to decide the shape of the puzzle and then it was just a matter of finding players that that were of that shape so they would fit in you know, and, and Clough famously got a group of players at Nottingham Forest, none of whom were household names. And it just worked as a team. And, they, you know, they ended up twice European champions. So uh, um, I think there are there is going to be many cases of this where you can see that it is a team sport, that, that the coach has managed to crack that problem to to assemble a group of players who can play together, complement each other's strength. They bring out the best in, in each other. And, you know, and then, and then of course you can have a completely opposite case where <laughs> some players bring out the worst in each other. And that, that's when I think you get the, um, the cases of, uh, failure, failure of a team that should, should do a lot it's, better. Uh, it seems, it seems so arbitrary, doesn't it? The, you know, when you watch a football team, you know that you've got this random bunch of uh, players and it just seems to be that the only thing that they have in common, because we know that they are interchangeable. Like we, I see this with my own team when I first followed them, that they, you know, <laughs> last year one player was in another team and he was being booed. This year he's in our team and he's being cheered, you know. <laughs> uh, but and it's, yes. once that jersey is on, and that, that, that totem, uh, everything seems to come together, you know. And that, I guess you say they're playing as a team, as people say. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I, th I think a good coach is is one who, of course, can spot who would fit into the system that they want to play. So a, a good coach, I think, first of all, has to have an idea of a system, has, has to know what he or she is trying to do. Uh, and not everybody, not every coach has that, I think. But even once you've got it, then it's also a question of finding the right people. So I really love it when a coach uh, is able to see some player in the lower mm. divisions and think that that player can do a job that's exactly the job that I need. Jamie Vardy, team. looking in your particular direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jamie Vardy. I mean, you know, he's played uh, low-level football, amateur I don't know exactly what happened to, to him. I don't, I don't know how he, he's gone from such obscurity. He was at Halifax Town for a long time. So, yeah. And then, and then suddenly he has this almost like a miraculous season. I think he's gone slightly off the boil a bit now, but he had at least one miraculous that's all, season. That's all a lot of people want, I think. <laughs> yeah. So mm. this is the idea. So that's what you're, you're talking about there is how, in the philosophical sense, how does, the whole, the team, emerge from the parts, the constituent parts. How does it... Sorry. Yeah. Well, uh, no, oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry uh, Stephen. How does that... Um, 
you know, I mean, it takes two two teams basically play together. So a football game then requires two holes. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I'd, that chapter ends by making exactly this point that football is is an oppositional sport. Um, and what I mean by an oppositional sport, uh, well, there there are some sports where you take turns, such as if if you're playing darts, one player throws, then the other player throws, uh, or if you're playing golf, you know, you, you're not legally allowed to put the other player off, say by nudging them just as they're going to take their, their put. <laughs> um, or bobsleigh, you know, the four man. Bobs, they they just take turns to go down. It's not as if one can intercept or overtake the other team. But but football, of course, is a, is a sport where you've got two teams playing at the same time. They're both trying to achieve their goals, but also stop the opposition from from their goals. So this this issue of emergence and the interaction of the parts, I think, has this further dimension that it's it's not just how you respond to your teammates. Uh, there's also a question of how you're interacting against the, the opposition. Um, because it's, uh, as well as being oppositional, there's also a kind of relative dimension to football in that um, scoring four goals is great, but if the opposition huh. get five, then it's, uh, it's still no good. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's about being better than... Uh, the team that's in front of you. Um, so I, I think that's uh, that just adds a further dimension to this this issue of emergence. I mean, you can have cases of of teams that are quite successful, uh, but then might struggle against another team that isn't as successful. But maybe they've got something in their side that it creates a real problem for you. Which hadn't created problems for other sides, you see. So so, yeah. Clearly, a very uh, complicated question. Now, moving on to another complicated question, I guess one of the more abstract concepts you deal with is the question of space, which is, um, which yes. although on, on, on one level it seems quite obvious, but as you and I both know, when you're talking about space and philosophy, it is uh, very, very uh, difficult and challenging. But in a basic sense, in a basic <laughs> sense, uh, philosophy, or sorry, uh, football is you know, a game played within certain parameters, within a certain space. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have much on the metaphysics of space and time because um, I, that's not my area at all, but I have spent some time thinking about empty space and its role in football um, because I think um, certainly as much as any other sport, football really seems to be about controlling, finding space, closing down space, exploiting space, attacking space. When, when you hear people, uh, players and coaches talk about the game, it's often in terms uh, of this. And, you know, is this purely metaphorical? Do they mean it literally? It, it seems there's some really weird and wonderful metaphysical ideas going on about space. So you can hear coaches say that, they want to compress space when they're defending an attack. So they're limiting the space for an attacker. But when they're attacking, they're trying to expand space. So I, I, I got to thinking about this because it's, it seems a very, very strange notion from a philosophical viewpoint that, you know, f so much of football is about empty space. Seeing empty space, attacking empty space, occupying space, um, and I th and I think that many of the uh, well, if you look at the evolution of football tactics over the last 150 years or so, you can see that a lot of that is a is a coach's attempt to to find that space and and take control of space. Uh, so we we've had a history where formations have changed for instance and i think that's been largely in, in response to trying to find that space and control the space um so and uh, i'll just give you one other sure. uh, one other example um so i saw um an interview with gary lineker many years ago 10 15 20 years ago 
where he explained one of the ways in which he was successful as a striker was that um, suppose someone he could see someone was out on the wing and there was a possibility of a cross coming in. He wouldn't wait for the cross to be played because the ball gets whipped in so quick that if you're not in the right place when the ball arrives, you're not going to get there anyway. So what he would do just before the cross was played, he, he said he would um, attack the space. So he would try to lose his marker, go into an empty space. And most of the time, the ball never came to him. It came to nothing. But on those occasions where it did come to him, then he had space. And space in football gives you time. So you can control the ball, bring it down, pick your spot. And that's one of the explanations for why he scored so many goals. I guess that's absolutely fascinating, this idea of empty space. Because if you think about it at a very obvious level, a football pitch is quite big and you've got uh, 22 players on the field and they're quite dwarfed by the pitch. But it's, it's I guess the magic of football comes from, and maybe this is true of uh, all field sports, is from how people manipulate the possibilities you know, the, the things that aren't there so much as the things that are actually there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. It does indeed. Um, yeah, I mean, it's w- one thing to say is that th- this sort of competition to find new formations and so on, and the way that we, we've evolved through various f- lineups and so on, well, that that's becomes more and more of a pressing issue because fitness levels have risen in, in football so so high which it kind of makes the space smaller and smaller all the time. So you now know at a professional level, when you receive the ball, you're not going to have uh, very much time on the ball because, you know, the other players are so fit, they're soon going to be up with you. So space is, I think, becoming an, uh, an ever more precious commodity in, in the game. Um, and, if, and yes, you, you're right to draw that connection between space and possibility because that empty space if if you can just win yourself half a yard as as they say in the penalty area then that's maybe enough to get the shot away you know and then uh, there's another another way in which empty space i think is also important a very obvious way is that um you know every goal that's scored is scored because of the absence of a defender or goalkeeper on the line blocking it mm. So it's not just a question of finding empty space for yourself. It's also you've got to exploit those empty spaces to you know, either play the pass. Every pass is successful just because there's nobody in the way blocking it. Same with every cross and corner and goal. So it's when you're shooting, you know, you're looking for that place where nobody is. That's, you know, you want the ball to cross the line at exactly that place where nobody is. So I, I think football is going to be full of exploitations of emptiness. That's very poetic and beautiful, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> See, it is aesthetics after all, yeah. Um, yeah, and also I think you've possibly given the first philosophical theory of the offside rule there. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, okay, now, um, moving on, I think... Uh, well, um, the other, because I wanted, I would like to cover sort of the central themes of your book, and I could, I could talk to you about mm. that all day, basically, uh, literally. But uh, the question of uh, chance is another theme that you look at. So I'm guessing you're talking about, you know, the idea of uh, fortune, risk, uh, contingency. Uh, is that something that is essential mm. to the nature of football? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it is. I, I mean, I, I think, first of all, that there's something in sport in general, which is that it's only interesting to us because everyone has a chance. So there's chance in that sense. It's not, not just about luck, although I am talking about luck. Uh, but I think everybody has to have a chance. So this this is also a case in which I've got a, an interest in this kind of dispositional theory, because if... Um, if the results of football were a foregone conclusion, you know, if, if one side literally had no chance, then I think sport would be of no interest to us at all. So if, if, for instance, whenever Manchester City play 
a lower ranked team, which is probably just about <laughs> every other team, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but if you know, if the best team always beat the weaker Celtic. team, I uh, yeah, and, and I think it would lose interest mm. to us. Um, so that that's no good in sport. If if the better team is sort of guaranteed to win. That's not interesting to us. But nor would it be interesting if the the outcomes of a sporting contest were pure chance, pure chance, because that, that would be like, um, you know, uh, tossing a coin is of no sporting interest to us because it, it might be of a betting interest, but it's not of a sporting interest because, you know, it is pure chance. And there's nothing that the uh, the person tossing the coin can legally do to affect the outcome. So I think what we want in sport is something like what I've just referred to, that that your endeavours in sport should uh, dispose or tend towards success. Uh, now, the better team might have a greater tendency to success than a, a weaker team, but it's still only a tendency. So the weaker team could could possibly win. And and that's when it becomes interesting to us. And it also means, you know, everybody does have a chance. The results are not entirely predictable and that the endeavours and efforts of the team are worthwhile. You know, if 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 results were a matter of necessity in advance, then the endeavours of the teams wouldn't matter because they couldn't influence it. Nor if they were, if sporting contests were were decided by pure chance. Again, your your effort wouldn't be worthwhile because it couldn't influence the outcome. What we want is something in between that your sporting prowess will have a tendency towards victory, and that's what you're aiming to manifest in the sporting contest. But it still allows that um, it is possible for a weaker team to, to be a stronger team. Now, so that's a general thing about sport, but there is something particular to football in this regard. Uh, so there was a study done in America, which, which I cite in the draft, that showed that if you, if you take three teams, let's call them A, B and C, and A beats B and then B beats C, you might think, if you didn't really understand football, that, of course, that means that A would beat C. Right. Uh, right. So, but the, uh, so there was a study done by some American statisticians claiming that football was flawed as a game because they analysed a succession of, of results of this kind between three teams. And they found that 17% of these cases were what they call inconsistent triplets. So that would be a case where A beats B, B beats C, but then A loses to C. <laughs> the underdog, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, there's a, there's a, an example of this from the end of last season. So uh, you, you can correct me if I get any of this wrong, but Manchester City lost to Manchester United. Sorry to remind you of this. They lost 3-2 when they'd been 2-0. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, then um, a, f- a week later, or was it just a few days, Manchester United were at home to That's West right. Bromwich Albion. And then a, f- a few weeks earlier, West Bromwich Albion had lost to Manchester City. So somebody who didn't really understand football might have looked at that in advance and seen, OK, so Manchester City can beat West Brom. And uh, Manchester United can beat Manchester City. So when Manchester United play West Bromwich, it should be a foregone conclusion. But as we now know, West Brom sneaked a 1-0 victory, didn't they? Uh, Now, the statisticians think this is a major flaw because uh, their calculations, which I'm sure isn't hard to work out, shows that if the outcome of football matches were pure chance, such as if it was decided on a coin toss, you would expect 25% of those triplets to be inconsistent, as as they've defined it. Whereas in reality, 17% are inconsistent. So they're saying the outcomes of football matches are not that much better than pure chance. 
Well, I really think they're missing the point of sport there. Uh, I don't think that sport is like a scientific experiment to determine which is the better team. And nor would I see it as a, a flaw in sport if the best team sometimes failed to, to lose. Uh, whereas there is a, a distinguished American philosopher of sport I've got a great respect for, uh, Scott Kretschmar. Uh, he had a paper in Journal of Philosophy of Sport called Game Flaws, in which he was kind of suggesting that it is a flaw in a sport if if the weaker opponent is allowed to beat the stronger opponent. But I, I think this gets it, it gets it wrong. I think it, a sport would lose all meaning if if the weaker side didn't have, you know, literally had no chance against a stronger opponent. So I I actually think uh, the fact that football can generate this 17 percent of inconsistent triplets is is actually an explanation or one explanation of its great success. You know, it throws up surprises. And that keeps it interesting. It's got fl- tra- and flaws contrast... and tragedies and all these type of things, yeah. Yeah, so it allows a creation of drama because it, it allows a narrative to be constructed about a giant killing act, you know, some team of minnows that's never had success and suddenly they play uh, Arsenal or some some giant team and then they beat them. You know, that that's that great, that's a great story and it's, it's a story that's great even outside of a sporting context as well. You know, you can see that, it, it, you know, if if you do your best, you might be able to triumph over, over adversity. So, you know, it can give us all hope to see that somebody has faced gigantic odds and triumph. So I, I think it's really important that, that a sport is able to do that. And the, and the fact, so what, what I was trying to say is that I think it could be part of the explanation of, of football being the, the world's most popular spectator sport is that it gets this balance right between skill and luck. So if, if, if football was all skill and no luck, then the best team would always win. You'd have um, 0% of inconsistent triplets. But if sport was all luck and no, if football was all luck and no skill, then you'd have 25% of, triplets were inconsistent the the fact that football has about 17 percent that actually tells me that 17 percent is about the right level that we want (laughs) from sport and so i'd contrast that with um rugby for instance so there are a few occasions where rugby gets a bit of a rough treatment from me oh dear Um, but uh, yeah but i mean they're they're tough people they can stand up (laughs) for themselves um, but whenever I've watched football, I've never found it as exciting as football. Uh, sorry, whenever I've watched rugby, I have never found it as exciting as football. And I've I've had to think quite hard about why it isn't. And th- there's various reasons. So I offer some of these in the book. Um, but one of the reasons is that um, in my experience, and I don't have the statistics, but in my experience, it is too predictable. Um, so I, I tell the story of uh, when I tried, um, I've been to a few games of rugby league because I'm from Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, so it's, it's um, you know, it's a real rugby stronghold. Um, and, you know, what you find is that you don't get the same sort of giant killing occur. And what you can get in rugby is that um, just a small difference in, in skill level can equate to a really big points difference at the end of it. So I tell the story of when I went to watch Dewsbury host Wigan um, in the Challenge Cup, and you know, and I was hoping to see, say if it was a, a football non-league team at to a league team, you'd, you'd want to see them and give it a right good go, even sure. if in the end they, they, they lose 2-0 unluckily. But this, from the the first minute, this was so boring. It was the most boring. This rugby game it ended up fifty six nil to Wigan, you know. And then, and that that was in the uh, there were eight ties in in that competition on the same day, and there were scores of seventy eight nil, and and you know there was there was four of the eight ties were just absolute slaughtering. So, I I think that that's showing to me that. Rugby doesn't have, well, basically, 
a high enough proportion of these inconsistent triplets. It, it doesn't have a high enough proportion of shock results, basically. And um, football, I think, has the balance that, right. That is why it's a superior game. Um, <laughs> I think okay. so, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I may be being very unfair to rugby and other sports, but, but this is a book about football, and I wanted it to sort of be in praise of football and explain its success. And there's no point me trying to hide the fact that football is my favourite sport. So you can always start with admiration, Stephen. You can always start with admiration, as Bash says. <laughs> um, do you, the last team that I'd uh, uh, look to before we, we um, conclude is the team you talk about. Well, uh, well, the main theme you talk about is victory. So football mm. is about winning. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to uh, consider this because, you know, it's easy to rhapsodize about football and think that it is the beautiful game and that it's a game we can think about philosophically. But it is about winning. Uh, so, yeah, as as I said at the start, it's... it's um, you know, everybody in the game would prefer to win ugly than to lose beautifully. Um, so I think it, it, the aesthetics of football has to be kept in its place. But uh, something that came out of that that's quite interesting is is um, something that I'd like to call a paradox because it's a it's a bit like the paradox of happiness, but it, it like the paradox of happiness, it's not strictly speaking a paradox. But the the conclusion I have is that um, if you try to be beautiful, if you try to create beauty, then you you will fail. You will inevitably fail because um, you should be aiming to win. You should want to win, hope to win, uh, rather than aim to create beauty. If you're aiming to create beauty, you, you're not strictly playing football anymore. So um, the idea is that beauty is actually something that's created when it is created on the occasions when football is crea- uh, beautiful. It's because the players are aiming for something else. They're aiming to win. But it's when you aim to win that you will uh, exhibit the, the aesthetic excellences of the sport. Uh, so, for instance, if... Um, you know, if if the team really wants to win and then a shot is played from distance, the goalkeeper really wants to win. So the goalkeeper is going to extend his or her body to its fullest extent and, and you know strain every muscle reaching to try and clutch that ball out of the air. Similarly, uh, players are going to run themselves into the ground. They're going to run the hardest. So... You're going to see that speed and power that that can produce some of the beauty in football. So it's it's like the case of where, um, you know, in the paradox of happiness, the idea is that if you just pursue happiness, you won't get it. Happiness is something that comes when you're aiming to do other things, Um, you know, whatever that might be. Um, So... I think that's what's going on with the aesthetics of football. There, there's something that's created when you're aiming to win. So there's a story I used to illustrate this. Um, so I was once in Paris for a philosophy conference, I would add, um, and I noticed that Paris Saint-Germain were playing. Uh, so I thought I'd go along and see this. Uh, and it was a, a two-legged... Um, I think it was the UEFA Cup back in those days. It's now called the Europa That's League, right. isn't it? Um, so it was a two-legged tie, and this was the first leg. Uh, and uh, Paris uh, had Ronaldinho playing for them at the time. And they, they took an early 2-0 uh, lead. Uh, and at this point, Ronaldinho started juggling the ball. and Showboating. Is showboating, doing these silly little tricks, and some people in the crowd were like, oh, "Yay, yay!" I suppose they were PSG fans. But as as a neutral in the stadium, I was really incensed. <laughs> this 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 is not football. A passionate neutral. Keepy uppy, <laughs> keepy uppy. You know, juggling the ball. That's not football because it's not uh, it's not contributing to the endeavour to to win the game. 
So I was getting very frustrated. I, I thought he's, he's not strictly speaking playing football. He's doing something else. So it certainly wasn't beautiful for me. I took no aesthetic enjoyment from it. I mean, maybe he was just trying to humiliate the opposition. I don't know. But they were only 2 0 up at the time. And in a two legged tie, That's I would have thought. That. Yeah, don't don't be juggling the ball. Try and score another Put it goal. To bed, yeah. Um, so yeah. do you think then? Uh, I guess I got two things to do. I want to just maybe conclude. I have a quote for you to listen to, and I want to see what you think. Um, a quote from Socrates. Uh, but I mean, just I'm wondering, how do you conceive of football? You know, people always say, well, sport in general is a very very tribal thing, um, and it's sort of it can be it can be quite atavistic. It can be quite irrational. Um, is there some? Do you think there's a rationality to football, or is it something that is just irrational? Mm. <laughs> well, um, this this is briefly mentioned towards the end of the book. I mean, I think you know, I, I said at the start that football is very multi-layered, and there's one way in which you could see it. I mean, it is a competitive sport, so there is competition there. You know, and you could see it's a fairly ruthless battle where victory is the aim. Um, so it, I think it would it would be quite easy to have a sort of um, competitive, individualistic kind of reading of football that it's just uh, you know the the strong trying to assert their authority over the weak and victory is all that matters and you've got to punish the weakness exploit the weakness of your opponent so it could seem like it's a fairly nasty thing when you view it that way but i i think there are other strands to it um so um you know i've already mentioned talking about holes that it is a it is a team game so it's a very cooperative thing as well uh it's it's showing that uh, you can achieve things as part of a collective that it would be impossible for you achieve, to achieve as a mere individual. You know, it's teams that win games. No, no one individual can literally win the World Cup. It's the team has to win the World Cup. The individuals only get to lift it if they're part of a good team. So, so there is something about uh, cooperation and collectiveness there, that the collectivity works precisely when you can cooperate. So I, I think actually, you know, it's it's possible to have very different readings of, of football. And there there is this trend. So, you know, you sometimes get footballers like Socrates, not the ancient Greek <laughs> philosopher, but the Socrates who played for Brazil in the 80s, a kind of left wing reading uh, of football yeah, which is uh, i have a quote for you from the one and the same socrates the also oh, <laughs> yes yes sorry, i should be clearer about that okay <laughs> i just i got to read a quote to you a brief quote uh, this is from uh, socrates's uh, biography uh, footballer philosopher legend by uh, andrew downey and uh, in this socrates says football gives you a contact with reality that other professions don't football is so democratic I was always around people with different social situations from my own, with different levels of education. So you see reality up close. Uh, so I was wondering what a metaphysician might think of that. <laughs> Gosh. Well, I, I, yeah, I am a metaphysician and I have thoughts about it, but I don't know if they're metaphysical thoughts. But I think he's absolutely right. My experience of football is that it is democratic in that sense. Yeah, you you are surrounded by people from all walks of life. They don't know what you do for a living. They don't care. The, they don't care. It doesn't matter. There is, it is democratic. So when I'm at the match, you know, I've, I've got a season ticket at Bramall Lane and the, the people I sit around, I have a chat with all the time. They don't know I'm a metaphysician <laughs> and I don't know what they do. It doesn't matter. We're there to see the football and it, but it, 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 Socrates, I think, is also right. It's very much a people's game. It's about people and interpersonal relationships. Uh, so I know this from, uh, you know, when you when you look at players and good managers. Obviously, my experience of it is a bit limited, but not as limited as you would <laughs> maybe think. Um, you know, I've I've been sometimes in managers' offices immediately after games and hear the sorts of conversations that's going on. And I think it is, it is very much about understanding people and bringing out the best in them. 
you know, football is is a really hard game to play and to succeed in. And uh, a lot of it is played in the mind. And a good coach has to be able to understand that person. You know, so, some people need a telling off and, and some people with a different personality just, uh, you know, they need a cuddle and they need consoling and, you know, they, they need building up. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think it is very democratic in that sense. We, I, I certainly got a sense of it. Um, you know, I'm a bit reluctant to go too much into personal politics, but I, w- I will stray in slightly. I mean, you know, when I was a real regular at, um, at Bramall Lane back in the 80s, you know, we were going through a period of real sort of political upheaval in the country. Right. You know, Th- Thatcher had come to power. We had the miners' strike, and I, I was supporting a team from South Yorkshire, big mining. Very live area. issue then, yeah. Yeah, it was really, really big issue for us, and it still is. It still is when Sheffield United play one of the Nottingham teams, for instance. It's uh, you know people still going on about that. But I, for, for me, I, I grew up in a in a small town in the middle of nowhere. Didn't even have a football team, and for me, it was an amazing experience to suddenly be around thousands of people from all walks of life, and it, it, I got a sense of a real sort of togetherness. Um, I mean, another, another reason you would get that, um, so I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, but in the 80s, football fans were absolutely demonised in, in the press, the government, on, yeah. hooliganism. And I, th- and I think this, the demonisation of the football fan um, basically is what, led to the Hill, Hillsborough disaster. You know, it's it's all coming out now about the, the sort of way in which people were regarded just because they liked football. Oh, yeah, they're absolutely uh, vilified. You yeah, don't absolutely ad- vilified is- uh, yeah, absolutely vilified. And, and you don't even admit in polite company that you were a football fan back in the 80s. Right. <laughs> Whereas now it's just so fashionable, everybody's happy to admit that they're football fans now. So... So for me, that was a real formative experience. You know, I, I was a really shy kid when I first started going to Bramall Lane and it, you know, it, it made me grow up and meet all sorts of people. But the other side of that, so yeah, we've got that. We had that nice togetherness of which Socrates is speaking. But then, of course, there is the, the other side of it, which is that there was an opposition. There were other people. There was this kind of, the enemy over the other end of the ground. And and uh, as time's gone on, I, I've started feeling really uncomfortable with that. I, I love football fans, no matter who they support. Well, I, I've got many friends who are <laughs> Sheffield Wednesday supporters. I'll, I'll be honest with that. But, Let's not go um, too far. You know, I, was, I went, <laughs> no, I went to the match on Saturday. Sheffield United were playing Norwich and it's a bit of a grud- grudge match, but I met these two Norwich supporters, uh, and we walked to the ground together and had a lovely time talking to them. So, you know, the, as you get older, you get to realise that football fans are pretty much all the same. And, and, you know, it's just somebody who loves the game but from another town. So I love hearing them, what they think about the team, the chances of the game and so on. So may, maybe even more together than us now than uh, back in the past. Thank you very much. Thanks for being with us, Stephen. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Bye. Come on, Jimmy. Who are you going to fight against when this balloon of yours goes out? Thank you for listening to The Well. Our theme tune is Love the Government by Il Papa Giraffe and is licensed under Creative Commons. You can follow us on iTunes or your preferred podcast app.